Uh, there, there are a couple things I want to touch on before I get into these slides, and uh, uh, these will kind of hopefully be reflected through this presentation. Uh, so one is the use of the word program. Uh, this, uh, you know, I don't know how many times I heard it on the table up here, uh, but uh, in our business, and we're in the disability business basically, uh, so the word program shows up a lot. Uh, programs and people typically don't mix real well. In other words, if I'm a person that has a need and the program is the answer to my need, the program is rarely the answer to my need. Let's put that right out there. Uh, I might need a service, a support, or an accommodation, but I don't need a program typically. Sadly, in our business, most of those services, supports, and accommodations are embedded somewhere within a program that maybe has a whole lot of things I don't need, but I have to put up with. So, and I understand programs thoroughly. I know why we have programs. We have funding streams. We have departments. We have agencies, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we have all of that, and it's often driven by money, uh, funding that comes in, personnel roles, regulations. You, know, you can go on and on why we have this program concept. Uh, but as we talk about young people with disabilities, moving from high school or secondary school to post-secondary education to employment and to a life, uh, the, the whole concept of having to do that through a series of programs is not real efficient, it's not real helpful, and if I mention the word program in this presentation, Deb Hart can yell at me over there. Uh, she's one of the people that uh, has really tried to reinforce this idea that we are not about programs, we're about people and we're about uh, being of a service or support to people. Uh, the other thing I want to uh, just mention is kind of the way we refer to people. And, and this is hitting home with me uh, just recently a little bit. We've started to work with uh, the people who, are referred to, who refer to themselves as wounded warriors. And sadly, we have a lot of these. Uh, people coming out of the uh, various wars that we've been involved with the last 10, 15 years. And uh, wounded warriors are seeking to access post-secondary education. Obviously through Veterans Affairs there are a lot of supports and services available uh, to go back to school. And particularly to go back to school and acquire 21st century learning, you know, STEM, the real skills that are going to move the United States forward, so to speak, in the world. So anyway, uh, in our center, uh, we have a number of these people entering, and uh, it's interesting how they refer to themselves and uh, how we are in the business we're in almost being forced to refer to them. Uh, so they refer to themselves as wounded warriors. So as I'm talking to them, it's kind of like, well, first, you're a guy just like I am. Uh, you know, and, and you have probably the same kinds of needs and persons and uh, kind of interests and desires and things that I have as a male, as an individual uh, in a university setting. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's probably first. And then you happen to be Filipino. So uh, you have a cultural base, a family base. Uh, you happen to be a person wanting to be a student. Okay, so there's three descriptors kind of going in line there. And then you happen to be a veteran. And you happen to not have your legs and a bomb went off near your head. And you have nightmares every night. You're wounded or you're a person with a disability. So, as you're coming to me and I talk about you or I talk with you, uh, how, should, how can I be helpful to you? So, if, just to kind of take this progression a little bit, if I'm going to look at you as a person first, I'm going to refer you to the admissions office like I would any other person. I'm not going to send you to the Veterans Affairs Office first, or the Disability Services Office first, or the Minority Education Office first. Those are all things that kind of come down the line that 
you might want to interact with if you have an interest in those things. So to make a long story short, kind of, we need to refer to people as people first. Okay, that's a very simple dynamic, and it helps a person decide what door to go to first when they're thinking about getting help or thinking about doing something. So in the case of this individual, the last place he was going to go was the disability service office as the wounded warrior. And he might go to the veteran of, Veterans Service Center within the university, but he wasn't going to go there first. He's going to go to all the places I would go to or any of you in the room would go to first as a student. So just the two things I mentioned, uh, use of the word programs and use of the word, or actually looking at a person as a person first, are, are kind of two really important things when we think about what we do and before we get into this discussion of self-determination. Uh, because self-determination is about people and it's about helping people to discover themselves. Uh, and I'm also going to then talk about agencies and agent helping agencies discover who they are as they attempt to help people. So they're, they're kind of two uh, critical things just to bring up. And I didn't really intend to do that, but kind of listening this morning a little bit, I thought this might be a good way to start this out. So uh, let's look at this title real quickly. So self-determination is the first word. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about at least what I think that is. And uh, maybe you as a person who's a service provider might interact with that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it relates uh, to you as a service provider and determining what you do and don't do or should do. Uh, so that refers to the word driver. So self-determination should drive the individual, it also should drive the agency. And then there's that nice word in there, interagency team, which kind of refers to collaboration or working together across agencies. Uh, since we are divided into agencies, we didn't, don't necessarily have to be, but our world is structured that way. Uh, so we become siloed within those agencies and we're guided by those regulations and those roles and responsibilities and we end up doing the things we're doing. Uh, so now we're saying, well, uh, we have to do them together uh, across agencies since we have that agency structure and the outcome of this is to improve post-school post outcomes of which we all know employment is probably the key outcome because if you're not employed, then you're typically not going to be living in a house or a community of your choice, and you're not going to have money to do things that you might want to do. So it's a very core outcome. And the whole premise of today is that post-secondary education is an important pathway to achieve a quality post-school outcome, being employment. Okay, so. Before I go to the next slide, just touch a little bit on, I'm going to be looking at uh, self-determination very broadly. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of a perception that comes out of the 1950s and 60s. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody in the room that was alive in that time. Uh, but the word self-actualization was a... Uh, cool word in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, self-actualization. Uh, you know, it's a very simple term. It, it basically means that you are in charge of your life. So it's kind of like this, like you're making this, the decisions you make in your life are driven by you or by somebody else, or they just happen to you. You know, we have Lots of people, and we're, I'm just talking about everybody. I'm not talking about people with disabilities necessarily. Uh, so the extent to which you're self-determined or self-actualized, or the other word that's out was out there. I don't know. Still, there is research around locus of control, uh, which if you're in there in a research environment, that's what you're studying. 
So it's basically to the extent to which one controls major decisions in their life. Or those things just happen to them. So relationships, you know, the person you married, did it just kind of happen? Or did you very constructively make the decision and the choice and marry that individual? The job or career you're in, did it just kind of happen to you? Like you went through school, you got a major in X, and uh, your parents knew somebody, and that was your employment contact, and my God, 20 years later, you're just doing this. Okay, that just happened to you, or in a very structured way, did you control and make the decisions, and you're where you're at today because you systematically took that on and made it happen. And you're satisfied or dissatisfied with whether you made it happen or just, uh, and there's all kinds of research kind of sort of showing that the greater the extent that things just happen to people, the more dissatisfied they are about all those things. And then that's kind of the whole construct of self-actualization and locus of control is the greater the extent one takes control of something the greater or the more uh, satisfied they are with those decisions. So th this is not new. Uh, obviously, the, the, the whole construct of self-determination has been around for years and years. About 20 years ago, people in the disability field kind of picked up, and mainly self-advocates or people with disabilities, and people that worked in the developmental disabilities environment uh, picked up the construct of self-determination and applied it to people with disabilities. Uh, but obviously it's been, it was around long before that. There are two key constructs in, in self-determination, in looking at self-determination. One is that you have to have some decision-making skills. Like if you don't know how to make a decision, or you don't want to approach making a decision, uh, you're missing that whole piece. The other is if you're going to make a decision, you have to have options to decide upon. Now, as this has been applied to the field of disability, my God, these two things were missing. That's the first thing that was discovered, so to speak. That one, people with disabilities had no understanding of how to make a decision. They had no skills. No one had ever taught them. And, or no one had even availed them of these skills. So they lacked that piece. Secondly, if they were taught to make a decision, there were no options available. Like there was a program to go to. There were no real options as to where you wanted to live, what you, how you wanted to work, where you wanted to work, what you wanted to do, all those sorts of things. So those two key pieces have to be in play for any of this to work. I think any of you that are working around looking at options for people with disabilities, and particularly those with significant disabilities, I know this is not necessarily an easy thing. Either one of those two things, teaching decision-making skills and finding or creating opportunities for options. Both of those can be a little bit difficult, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to play that piece down. But those are critical pieces if you're going to do things in the area of self-determination. Uh, there's a few things that have driven this, and I've talked about this a little bit, and uh, actually some of the speakers at the table just prior to me touched on uh, all of these, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, one of the areas, one of the players in this environment is the whole lower ed sector. Uh, and particularly special education providers, teachers in, uh, in high schools, transition specialists, counselors, other people uh, who are under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And uh, for several years now, since the mid-80s, there has been language in the IDEA speaking to preparing young people with disabilities for adulthood. Under the, under the word transition. This language was put in there in, uh, in 1983. And 80, you know, so we're looking at uh, more than 20 years here. But in 04, the last reauthorization of IDEA, very specific language was put in regarding 
employment as an outcome and documenting that employment after school. So uh, there's really an effort to try to push or force special educators uh, to focus upon post-school outcomes and particularly employment for all people, all students with disabilities. Okay, and that's been augmented by the last reauthorization to higher ed act and Catherine talked about that quite a bit so I'm not going to mention it. Uh, but people with intellectual disabilities specifically are mentioned in the Higher Ed Act uh, during the last reauthorization. Uh, so that's a very important move. A lot of this has been augmented by changes in other, in uh, health and human service uh, authorizations at the U.S. Department level. And uh, particularly Center on Medicaid and Medicare Services. I know California has been involved in a lot of these efforts. Money follows the person. Uh, these are all efforts to uh, teach a person with a developmental or intellectual disabilities to make decisions and to develop options or choices for people who are making those decisions and to have money then or funds follow those decisions. So, and this includes MIG grants, the DMIE grants. So these are all authorizations and uh, various grant programs that money uh, supported money to flow to states. Uh, along with this has been, I mentioned, uh, kind of this national self-determination movement that has about 20 years under its feet. And uh, uh, all of this speaks to uh, actualizing people with disabilities, to make decisions about their own life, and to support those decisions with funding, services, and supports. All of this has raised expectations. So, you know, if you look 20 to 25 years ago, the expectations of persons with intellectual disabilities and autism are significantly higher than they were at that time. Uh, so over time, uh, we've made a lot of, in, uh, lot of uh, movement in these areas. Okay, so I wanna kinda now, I'm gonna start talking about, about self-determination and self-determination as a driver. A driver, it, it, this is referring to it makes it happen. In other words, I don't want to say it forces them something to happen, but it points you in the direction, in the direction of it happening, and hopefully provides the guidance for this to occur. So, looking at uh, self-determination as, uh, as a process of determination, it should, one, determine the needs, interests, goals, and support requirements of the person, person with intellectual disabilities or autism. It also should help in determining the roles, responsibilities, and requirements of the supporting agency. So if self-determination is the driver of what you do, uh, it means these two things have to align with each other. In other words, if, if the goal of a person with an intellectual disability is to do X, X, and X, then how do we support or assist the agencies that might be involved to support X, X, and X in an individualized way? That, that, that's, that alignment or that coming together should result in aligned services, supports, and accommodations, ensuring successful outcomes. So that's kind of where we're going to attempt to go here in the next 20 minutes or so, is uh, to look at self-determination as a process that assists one to become aware and explore, determine, and as that occurs at the same time, the agency supporting that individual do the same thing. So we're talking about people developing, changing, and agencies at the same time becoming aware, developing, and changing around the individual. So let's take a look at operationalizing this a little bit. And, uh, I know this might be a different way to think about yourself, and it might be a different way to think about your, quote, clients or persons with disabilities, uh, but it, it's, it's a nice way to interface uh, self-determination with this process. So I'm talking about this now, operationalizing self-determination, both for the person with a disability and the supporting agencies that might be assisting or supporting that individual. 
So as the individual discovers themselves, the agencies, persons working in that agency, also discover themselves in the same way. So you discover how you might in a different or a more individualized and a more appropriate way uh, support this individual. So we're looking at uh, two things here. And, and this is a, a pretty simple way to look at self-determination. So one is creating awarenesses of oneself. So awarenesses of one's, those awarenesses are typically one's interests, one's strengths, like what are you good at? Weaknesses, so if you have a disability, what are, what, what are the actual weaknesses of that disability? the needs that I might have given my strengths and disability, and what, what I want to do with all this. What are the desires? Now sadly, young people with disabilities coming out of high school typically know none of this. Like, they don't even know what their disability is, typically. I've had kids come out of high school, special ed programs, who had no idea what the disability type was, much less what, their dis what could they describe their disability. Uh, so, so we're in a little bit of sad shape there. Uh, and this dis it isn't just related to people with disabilities. Most people, most young people coming out of high school are not self-determined, let's put it right out there. I wasn't, when I came out of high school, I knew nothing about being an adult or what I wanted to be. My mother thought I should go in the military so she could get me out of the house. Uh, and that was about what I knew. I sort of knew that I didn't want to work with my hands because I had been doing it already for three or four years and it was hard work. And some people sat behind desks that looked a hell of a lot easier and they happened to go to college. So that's how they got there. And that, that was sort of the extent I was self-determined. So we're not just talking about young people coming out of special ed programs, even though there's a much higher need to be aware of, of yourself and your strengths and weaknesses if you, uh, if you have a disability. Now the second part of this is an uh, important piece. It's, so on one hand, we have you as a person. On the other hand, we have the various environments, the context. So we're talking about an awareness of yourself, your interests, strengths, weaknesses, in relation to school, work, community, daily life, leisure. Otherwise, all that does is give context to your interest. So you're not interested just in nothing, or not interested in nothing, the interests are in relation to those contexts. So those two have to come together. And they have to come together not only for the individual, but also the agency. We're going to look at that a little bit more. OK, so being aware is one thing. And awarenesses are considered a pretty shallow part of this process uh, when you're thinking of self-determination. Typically, you have to explore your awarenesses. And uh, you typically explore those awarenesses within the context of something. So let me give you just a, a real simple example. And this is way back in the days when uh, I did work sampling uh, for an occupation. And uh, so we had young kids, and young kids with disabilities coming out of special ed programs who indicated an interest in cosmetology. You know, so this is working in people's hair. Uh, nowadays, you work with fingernails and feet, you know, toes and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, here you had these groups, like 50 kids, and uh, cosmetology came up. You gave a brief description of it, and all these hands went up of young women, particularly saying, oh, yeah, you know, this sounds great, blah, 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 that, I would like to do that. Uh, Okay, so that's an awareness. This person actually indicated they wanted to do this. Uh, they may have no idea what was involved in actually doing this. So the next step was to allow them to explore a little bit and figure out exactly what this was. So exploring it was actually having these young girls get their hands in people's hair with shampoo, 
rubbing, dealing with chemicals on their fingers, actually cleaning someone's toes, yep, personal, dealing with people's feet. Let me tell you, almost 90% of the young women that raised their hands, after exploring this for a couple hours, said, I can't do this. You know, I can't get that close to another person. I don't want my hands in somebody's hair massaging their head. This, I, I just can't do this. So in a very simple way, that was allowing someone to explore. In other words, for one hour, actually tasting that environment, that context, and getting a sense of it and being able to say something about it. Now, uh, this rarely happens for young people. And that's just one simple context within a career field. There are thousands, obviously. That has to happen, though, for somebody to begin to start the process of self-actualizing or self-determining. You have to have the opportunity to try it out. You have to be able to get personal and close with it. And preferably, you have to do it over time. So where does that happen a little bit? Like it typically happens in internship kinds of programs. It happens work study types of programs. But that's exploration. That's not placement. It's not employment or anything like that. It's step two in this process. Now, that opportunity to explore should result in some kind of understanding. It's that interaction of the environment and the self. And I used to describe it as when that happened, it was kind of like a light bulb went on. It was something like, gee, I like something about this. Or this is me versus this is just something people do. Okay, that's obtaining understanding. It's the understanding of the continuous interaction between oneself and the context of the environment that's explored. Okay, the opportunity for that to occur for anybody in our educational systems, both higher and lower ed, is very rare. Like, like it happens, really, it happened for me once in a sociology class as a sophomore. Like I was struggling to get through freshman and sophomore years in college. You know, you had to take all that required crap. All, all the English classes and the history classes, stuff like that. And I was about ready to quit and just get a job and uh, get on with life. And I was in a sociology class where I think the, the teacher was actually a very poor teacher. Like they gave you a whole lot of space without a, much definition. And you kind of worked in groups and all of a sudden it hit me as I was working with this group that I was just as smart as everybody else in that group and anything I said actually made more sense than what they said. And somehow there was something about the dynamics in that class that allowed that to emerge. And it was kind of like, geez, I can be a student, you know, I could be a teacher. And, and it kind of clicked. So it was happenstance, you know, it didn't, there wasn't anything systematic that that teacher did for that to occur, but there was an allowance for that to happen, and it happened, and it kind of allowed me to drive forward and further explore myself and figure out that I could do this. Now, the, this is something that we probably should structure for people and provide that opportunity for those awarenesses to be created within different contexts, for exploration to happen, and for understanding or realization to result. Okay, then you have a person that's prepared to self-determine. Okay, so I just use the word prepared. It's kind of like you're, you're right on the starting end of this. You're, you're ready to put together a plan for where I want to go. And the agencies, hopefully the, the various support providers, the educators, the rehabilitation specialists, the developmental disability specialists, the higher ed personnel that are going to be involved are also ready to support you to do that. And this typically results in a, uh, a support plan 
So, so it's a support plan that matches up with one's self-determined desires, interests, and needs, and the, the services, supports, and accommodations are detailed in an individual way for that individual. Okay, so the outcomes just indicated are opportunities to explore. Choices result from those opportunities to in the choices to understand, decisions to be made, and supported progress towards goals. Okay, and the outcomes of that we have new awarenesses and understandings of person-centered or person-focused interests, strengths, and directions new awareness and understandings of the types of services and accommodations which support those desired and authentic directions. And this is in a person-centered plan for the individual. So typically, and I'm gonna talk about how we do this a little bit in some of our uh, uh, service systems. Uh, results though in a person-centered planning which wraps around the individual and it's aligned with the coordinated agency support plan. Okay, and that's all driven by this working hypothesis. And uh, I'm gonna, this will kind of help us then to walk through uh, a series of uh, just kind of descriptors of the resulting uh, uh, ser services, supports, and accommodations that might be provided. So if a person is allowed or is supported to self-determine their education and employment goals and have access to a determine, an agency with determined supports to realize those goals in inclusive age-appropriate environments, so those are important pieces also, these youth will achieve significantly improved transition and employment outcomes. In other words, the opportunity will be greater for them and the quality of those opportunities will be better than if they didn't do this and you didn't do this. Okay, so we're kind of leading, moving down that path. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about operationalizing this. Because uh, we've been talking very conceptually about self-determination as a process. It's a process of uh, learning, growing, becoming aware, exploring, understanding oneself related to one's various contextual environments. And, uh, and this is important. I think it's not just important in lower ed and, and post-secondary ed, but when you get out in the real world, in the employment world and uh, out on the street, this is seriously important. Let me just give you an example uh, before I get into this. Uh, in our center, we, actually, we hire a lot of people with disabilities uh, in faculty roles and in various support roles. And, uh, and I interview a lot of these people. And one of the first questions I'm gonna ask them is, you know, why do you wanna do this? Why do you want this job? So I expect somebody to t be able to tell me in other words, to be aware of what that job is uh, and to be able to tell me the interface between themselves and the job, be able to tell me why they are interested and what their strengths are and why they want this job. And so those are serious things I'm asking the person. I'm asking them to describe, they've read the job application and hopefully they've gone to my website, they've done other kind of work, so they know the job a little bit. So I'm expecting them to be able to describe themselves in relation to that job. Okay, not too many people can do that, but if they're in my interview room, I'm gonna probe and probe and probe until I'm gonna force them to try to do that. And I'm gonna judge them on how they do it. Okay, second, if they have a disability, I wanna know what are the accommodations they're gonna need to do that job. So if they're blind deaf, is the disability that they display, uh, I want them to describe to me how they're gonna do this job. Now, I don't have to describe to them. They have to tell me how they're going to use the computer, how they're gonna interact in meetings, how they're gonna teach classes, all the things that might be make up that job. So I expect them to not only know their disability in relation to this job, 
but I expect them to know what the accommodations and supports are that they're going to need to do that job in a high quality way. Okay, so I'm expecting an awareness. I'm expecting them to have explored that awareness in relation to the job they're applying for. And I expect them to understand their strengths and weaknesses and, and be able to tell me what the accommodations are. And then I expect them to tell me how much that's going to cost me. So if they need a large screen with large print, cost 20 grand, I want to know that right now. Because uh, that's part of the application process. So th th this is... This person has to, is, there's a lot expected of that person in that interview. Uh, so the question is, like, who prepares this person to do that? That, that is something probably any employer is going to expect of a person with a disability walking in to a job interview. So that's real world after post-secondary ed. So we need to be able to, if we're not teaching the individual to do that, either their advocate or someone who's going to be supporting them in getting that job needs to be able to do that. Uh, so that all that's doing is just taking what I just talked about and kind of applying it now post higher ed in the, real, in, in the job market. So it's always the question right away, where do people get those skills? Where are they reinforced? Are they applied continuously as one goes through the various services, supports, and accommodations that they receive. Okay, so just looking at this now, so I'm going to kind of take you through a series of projects that we work on that apply these principles and, uh, and work on producing self-determined individuals so that they will actually experience that improved opportunity and quality of employment when they leave. So the first principle uh, that's applied, and most of you know about that. Person Center and Planning's been around for probably 20 years, uh, and I'm just throwing that those years out there pretty randomly, but uh, it, it's, a, the, it's been around for a long time. Uh, so, and it basically refers to pulling together a plan based on the interests, desires, and the needs of the individual. It's an individual or a person center plan. And that person's going someplace through post-secondary ed, maybe to a certain employment role or a certain quality of life. And this is done through interagency teaming. In other words, the person center plan is then matched up with a team of potential service providers. So what we're talking about in here, the key providers are typically secondary ed personnel, rehab personnel if employment's involved, uh, DD, like regional services, I guess in California, these guys are called, uh, and other kinds of adult service agencies, and the post-secondary ed institution. So you, I, I just pointed out four key players in an interagency team. There could be a whole lot of other players that might be involved. In Hawaii, it's all kinds of nonprofits in this business, and they're typically players. Okay, and it involves what we refer to as multiple enrollment. Now, now this, I think you guys are doing this pretty much, so it shouldn't be a foreign term. All, all it means is I'm all of these things at one time. I didn't get passed off. In other words, I am a student eligible for special ed services, maybe up to 22. I am eligible for rehabilitation services, and I'm enrolled. I am in the DD service sector, and I am enrolled receiving those services. And I am a student in a community college, and I'm receiving those services. And I'm doing them all at the same time. So I'm multiply enrolled. So that means I didn't get passed off by one agency to another agency to another. The, the pass off phenomena uh, you know, it's related to funding streams and things like that. But uh, this is a real common thing that, uh, man, it's got rid of that person and VR has them now. You know, and then they get rid of them after a closing and somebody else has them. And uh, so the pass-off phenomena, we're trying to avoid that totally. And uh, so everybody stays in the pot, uh, which is nice. Bring in a lot of resources, a lot of expertise, 
uh, a lot of things wrapped around this individual. And those, ex those resources and expertise then are individualized given that person's service, accommodation, or support need. And that is done through what we refer to as the front door approach. So the front door approach goes back to describing that wounded warrior that I talked about. The front door is, it's the door everybody goes through. You and I went through it, everybody else goes through it. And uh, in a college setting, it's the general admissions office. That's where you go first, probably, to get in. Uh, you don't go to the disability service office or uh, some other office that is way down the chain someplace. So we're going to talk about the front door because that, that's, it's, it's a very important dynamic in the whole self-determination process. Uh, so benefits for youth are this is individualized. Uh, it focuses directly on them. The participation in inclusive post-secondary experience, this is a benefit that uh, they're, they're going to receive the same benefits as everybody else, their same age peers, uh, which is important. So we have students who are enrolled in high school and in the community college and in VR and in DD services all at the same time. And they, they are with their same age peers technically, but receiving lots of different services. So they have opportunities to develop all kinds of skills, academic, vocational, social skills, build their self-confidence. Obviously self-determination is kind of directly related to building self-confidence. And the long-term benefits I've been talking about a lot are improved opportunities and quality of employment and hopefully independence, interdependence, and confidence. So for the team, so you should be benefiting as a service provider right along with the individual, working as a team across agencies or multiple enrollment should result in shared resources. In other words, there should be a cost benefit to this. I think very few people ever get to that point where they see the benefits. But uh, working together, there's absolutely no reason that there, should not, there shouldn't be a cost benefit for agencies. Uh, there's opportunities to see youth participate, to benefit, to thrive in multiple dual interagency enrollment experiences. And uh, there should be an opportunity to reduce or eliminate duplication. I mentioned save time and cost. Uh, the way I've kind of put it to agencies as we do interagency teaming is you're sort of front-loading this process. That you, it might cost a little bit more time at the beginning as you get to know each other and you figure out each other's regulations, roles, responsibilities, your limitations, your funding. And, but that front load, the time that you put in the front end should be paid off in the back end by reduced cost, reduced time, and uh, added benefit. So entering the front door, I want to kind of just talk a little bit about this. This is a little bit of a unique concept. Rather than talking about the inclusion, uh, th this is kind of based on the premise that if you're not excluded, there isn't any such thing as inclusion. You're included. So we actually create excluded opportunities for people, and then we try to undo them and include them. Uh, so. The idea is, hey, maybe uh, let, let's just go through the door where everybody else goes through and not exclude people to start with. And we don't have to expend a lot of energy creating uh, opportunities to be unexcluded. So why do we do this? Inclusion, obviously, is one of the key principles for front door. And uh, uh, self-determination and agency determination are key to implementing a front door approach. So entering the front door kind of works something like this. And, uh, and this, this is the way all of the students that are proceeding through the various efforts that we're undertaking, they all kind of go through this process. So everybody starts out on what we refer to as level one. Level one is the front door. It includes all services that are available to any student pursuing high school diploma 
or a post-secondary education certificate degree or uh, any level of participation. So all of the students, no matter what your disability is, or the, you have 10 different disabilities, and you require all kinds of supporters, you're still going to enter through the front door. Uh, everybody starts there. Now, if entering through the front door doesn't work on, for some reason, or you need a support or a service beyond what the front door offers, then you're going to build on that, you're going to address that need through level two services. And these are accommodation services and supports that are typically provided to a student with a disability. So in high school, these might be traditional special ed services, or in post-secondary ed, their disability service office or other types of services that might be provided uh, to a person. But you're not going to go, you're not going to enter with those services. You're only going to inquire about those services given a specific need that you have based on your front door experience. Okay, so a simple example is filling out the application form. So I'm filling it out and Due to my disability, I can't complete it. Uh, then I might proceed to a level two service just to complete that, and then I'm going to revert back to level one. Uh, other words, services that everyone else. So I'm going to tap the services based on a specific need that I might have. Now, say I'm receiving some level two services, and I still can't complete that application form. Uh, then I'm going to acquire for that specific purpose for a higher level support, meaning that I may have to have somebody fill it out for me or uh, something else. And typically level three services are much more individualized. They might be comp more comprehensive. Uh, if you've heard the term wraparound services, they may include a whole set of services and supports like that. But they're based on very individual student needs and again, the level three service uh, is going to address the specific need. So I, I'm not being placed. In other words, I'm either for life a level one uh, person receiving level one services and or level two and or level three. This is very fluid, it's progressive, it's flexible. Basically, I am a student first and then uh, I'm going to look towards these various levels of services based on individual needs that I might have. So let's look at this and it typically uh, we're going to look at it in high school first and we're going to apply to higher ed. I go to the admissions office or I go to a counselor's office who has applications. Yeah? Like I don't go to the special ed teacher and say I'm thinking about uh, like most special ed teachers have no idea how you apply to college. Uh, so going there doesn't help anyway, but uh, that's typically where a lot of special ed students uh, think they're supposed to go. So, but you go to the admissions office, you look at various programs, like the math department advisor, if you're interested in math, you talk to him or her, the college counselor, or personal transition program that might be in the high school. So these are all front door places that you would go to inquire about uh, going to college. Now looking at the college, in our, our case where we're working real extensively within community college settings. So what are all the front doors in a community college setting? There's typical academic advising, career employment centers, financial aid offices. Uh, there are all kinds of special needs. Uh, man, you, you go to a community college and they have funding for all kinds of special needs that have nothing to do with disability. You know, if you're culturally different, you're ELL, you're on and on and on, there are all kinds of efforts or supports for you. A student with a disability can access and actually benefit from all these front door supports. So, just looking at level two now, entering the community college, th these would be level two type supports that might be provided by a disability service office. And things like note taking, uh, various other accommodations related to extra time, most of you are familiar with these, physical access issues, things of that sort. So again, you wouldn't proceed there 
unless you needed some of those things very specifically. And level three supports and services. In most cases, we would, the interagency team would assemble this package of services and supports. So again, these are things needed by the student beyond the scope of level one and level two services. So it means you don't give up on them. You sort of fill the holes that they don't provide with a comprehensive package at level three. See, the way it typically happens now is you are considered level three and you never even go to any of these other places. Like you would never address or you would never seek regular student services. You would never, typically, we have disability services offices that don't want to talk to students with autism or intellectual disabilities. They're beyond the scope of what they provide. So, but you're still going to check them out and if there aren't services available to meet your needs, then the interagency team is going to assemble a package that would address those. And those may include coaches, educational coaches, or educational assistants, various travel training, and all numbers of things to get prepared for, to get to, to participate within, to benefit from, to get back home, to study, uh, all those kinds of things are part of these packages. Okay, and we typically, so I just kind of talk through this within these three phases. We always talk about transition as a preparation linkage implementation process. So preparation is typically in secondary school. Linkage is linking with the various agencies. I think the age 16 was mentioned up here, used in California a lot. A 14 is used a lot of places as the point where interaction of different agencies might be linking to that individual and then actually implementing those programs. And for the student, this allows them to dream or envision, to advocate, participate, be part of. So just real quickly, some of the things that happen at the preparation phase, uh, we're identifying prospective students. So we're talking to teachers, counselors, and students back in the ninth grade is where this begins. And uh, students begin to become aware, to explore, to understand, and to contribute to choices. And this includes readiness activities, preliminary person-centered planning meetings with the student and family, and uh, then those first meetings are typically scheduled around uh, at, at the end of the ninth grade. Linkage, so you're basically talking about the interagency team entering the process. We provide training, professional development to those teams uh, is the role at the university. And uh, the first meeting is held. Typically we have parent awareness at meetings and trainings that are prior to team meetings because parents often uh, not only are not aware themselves, uh, but due to their lack of awareness are often barriers in this process. Uh, they're very concerned. I know you're, most of you are sure familiar with the age of majority at age 18 with students with disabilities. Uh, most parents are very concerned about that happening and very con some parents are concerned about their children becoming self-determined uh, because they're used to making the decisions, even though they're aware at age 18, this individual can make a decision, so they're almost more comfortable if they don't know anything so the parent can continue to make the decision. You know, it's a, uh, somewhat of a complicated process right around there for teachers and uh, family members and the individual, the student. Okay, and implementation is usually carrying out the plan and uh, these are the various things then that happen with the community college. So uh, kids go right through the same thing that everybody else goes through, new student orientation sessions. Uh, we might add things on personal safety, awareness, drugs, alcohol, other kinds of things that these kids might get in, or young people might get involved with. Uh, looking at campus routines. Uh, you'd be, un it's unbelievable what people don't know uh, in terms of uh, campus life, uh, just what goes on, like parents don't know. 
Uh, something I wanted to mention right at the beginning is this first generation concept. Uh, like post second, most parents of students with disabilities, intellectual disabilities and autism, many of them are first generation. Like they're, they didn't go to college, so the idea, not only if their kid would go to college, but their kid with autism or intellectual disabilities would go to college is just off the map. And uh, very hard to conceptualize, very hard to understand. And I think you almost need to realize this, that, uh, that the whole first generation concept related to self-determination, it means that nobody in that family has had the opportunity to experience anything related to higher ed in, in even sense that this might occur for themselves, much less their own child. Uh, so there's very little opportunity for any of this to ever have been discussed, any awareness is to have been created, or any uh, exploration or understanding to occur. So often, uh, this is the first step. It's like stepping off the cliff somewhat and uh, uh, for these students to, to kind of experience this and become somewhat aware of what uh, higher ed might be. So th this is just continuation of the implementation, some of the services and supports that are wrapped around. Uh, we involve educational coaches. It's kind of one of the parts that uh, we provide out of the university for students and uh, uh, th this has become a real interesting model of supporting people. It's definitely not doing anything for a student, but it's supporting them to do things themselves, which is a big part of being self-determined. And so on and so on. This is just kind of the implementation of the interagency team. And our teams typically meet formally, semi-annually. Uh, like for a full day, and then there are meetings that uh, might be focused around specific problems that the team is having uh, that might be quarterly or monthly. And the teams basically focus on things like looking at services and supports, better coordinating those things, troubleshooting problems, identifying new opportunities and challenges. Uh, one of the things recently in Hawaii that the Rehabilitation Department has started doing is uh, instead of providing employment supports themselves, they started bundling these and contracting them out to companies. Uh, so like Hilton International is it's a large, obviously, a company in Hawaii with several hotels who now actually provides rehabilitation services under a contract for the Department of Rehabilitation. Uh, so VR counselors aren't involved, and there's nobody in the disability industry involved. It's a subcontract. Their people received X training through our center, and they provide these services uh, within the context of their employment settings. So it's a little bit different model that uh, just a little, kind of an innovative way for VR to look at things. So just real quickly to wind up, uh, the student process typically involves dreaming, what I described a little bit, then advocating, then participating. And that results in uh, hopefully in uh, approved opportunities uh, and a better in quality employment. So just real quickly, this is my email address. And uh, if you're interested in some of these things, a lot of this stuff is posted on that website, uh, cds.hawaii.edu. And we'd be happy to help you out or answer any questions. And I think also this, this afternoon session will be an opportunity to do some of this. So thank you very much. My name is Miha Aronovic. I am the father of a highly functional autistic child, uh, 18 years old. And um, everything you describe here, I I'm very interested in the idea of employment or studies for functional, highly functional autistic kids once they finish the high school. But the whole idea that you, that you have here is that I'm going to take an autistic child. I assume that he's able to express, to say what he wants and what goals he has. And then I'm going to provide him with all the services required to be able to compete with normal people in a job. And this does not work. Statistics show that 99% of these children, if they fail at the first job, they will live with their parents or take care of for the rest of their life. 
and there are tons of money invested into an activity that has not been proven ef efficient, at least until today. So the, the thing I want to draw your attention, there is a, a new approach, which um, there is an entrepreneur in uh, Denmark whose uh, younger son is autistic, and he did not tolerate to have a difference between his other two and his younger son. So he started a company specific for autistic children. Because autistic children have certain qualities that normal mainstream people don't have. For example, an attention to details, which is extraordinary. My son can build Legos over 2,000 pieces from plants. I cannot do that. I don't have the patience to go through the whole thing. So uh, it's got certainly certain talents. So he decided to create a company which is for profit, doesn't take any money. I mean, in a country like Scandinavia, or maybe here in California, you can get some funding for sheltered and uh, sheltered, artificial type of employment. The state is going to pay for it. Uh, some charity is going to pay for it. But if we can incorporate them in society, in company designed to employ them, and you have an example, Harvard Business School wrote a whole case about it. And we live in California. In California, there's a lot of entrepreneurial thing going on. There are lots of large companies here. It's just a question of making an awareness that these children exist. So what you do, you have a different type of job description, not made for the mainstream, made for them. Also, in this company, they charge more per hour for an autistic child because the quality of the work, I'm talking about uh, quality assurance in software, it's extraordinary. These guys are extremely meticulous and the quality is ex excellent. The company makes $2 million a year, pays salary to 37 autistic children, plus about 10 who are not there. So I'm wondering you, what's your perspective on that? Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, you asked a lot of questions. Uh, my, my general sense is this, and I'm not against anything you're saying. Uh, my general sense is that that isn't where you start, though, with an individual. Like if, if the starting point is uh, children with autism or very extensive autism should do a specific thing or should be in a separate program, and that's the premise you're starting from, then all the other possible opportunities that an individual might be able to pursue and might be supported to do, uh, never get on the table. You know, it kind of goes back to when I graduated from high school, my mother said, you should join the military. Uh, if I had taken her advice, that was the only option on the table and the only thing I was aware of, uh, that's what I would have done. And, you know, who knows? I probably would have retired after 20 years and been doing great. But, uh, <laughs> but my, my general message is, uh, I think that works for some people, but it should be individualized. If it's gonna be available, it should be the choice or an opportunity to know and to choose that option, uh, rather than that option being presented as the option for people with, uh, in this case, autism. That, that's kind of, you know, and I, I don't want to get into the big argument of sheltered versus competitive versus integrated, and uh, there's long history on all of that. It, it, I think my, my general uh, sense on all this is that irregardless of the disability, the level of the disability that a person might have, if the proper support package is put, is put together, that individual can succeed. And, uh, and they can succeed in a whole range of different things. So it really comes down to that versus sheltered, versus separate, versus integrated in there. So I didn't answer your question, but uh, th that would be the best I could say. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.